So we've been focusing the last four weeks on a series called Peace of Mind. And the main focus of this series has been on mental health and some of the myths surrounding mental health. And we've covered some, some difficult topics. And we've talked about the ways that God meets us in our mental health concerns and some of the ways that the Bible speaks about mental health. But I think today's topic might just be the most difficult, the most complicated of the topics we've talked about. Today we're talking about trauma. And I'm not an expert, I'm not a psychologist, so I decided that for that definition, I would seek the experts. And the American Psychological Association says that trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event. That terrible event can be something short-term. It can be a one-time event, like experiencing an accident or a natural disaster. It can mean being a victim of violence or abuse. But it also can refer to a long-term event, a prolonged event, like experiencing bullying on a day-to-day -day basis or perpetual abuse. It can also be even more complicated, more complex, involving a multitude of different traumas, a multitude of different traumatic events, both short-term and long-term. And as I think about it, I'm reminded of some of the many members of our church, especially those who come to our Spanish service. And those, most of you know that most of the people who come to our Spanish service are asylum seekers, refugees that have just recently come to the United States. And I'm sure you've heard some of the horror stories about the road to get here. And even some of the things that have caused them to leave their homes and their families. And that is trauma. That's traumatizing. Things I can't even begin to imagine or put words to. And even if there are those of us here who haven't experienced trauma firsthand, I know that it affects all of us because it affects those that we love, those that we care for. And there's no way of knowing who around us has been the victim of a traumatic event. It's something that often gets carried alone, kept a secret so as to try to forget it, hope that it goes away. It can be very isolating. So the question is, what can the Bible possibly teach us about trauma? And honestly, the Bible says a lot I think about God's people and one common denominator that I see between all of God's people is that they were continually victims of traumatic experiences. You can think about the Old Testament. You can think about the New Testament. Think about the Israelites were enslaved multiple times and the trauma that goes along with that. They experienced war death all around them, famine, thirst. And then we have our text for today from the Apostle Paul. Ooh, maybe we don't have our text for today from the Apostle Paul. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I thought it was going to be on the screen for us. But from our text today, you heard some of those words, some of the things that Paul had been through. It says that on multiple occasions he was beaten, he was whipped. On three different occasions he received 39 lashes from the Jewish leaders. It says also that he was beaten with rods. He was imprisoned more times than he could count. He was turned in by his own friends and family. People he trusted, people he loved, 
betrayed him, hurt him in unimaginable ways. He was shipwrecked three times. And on one of those times, he spent an entire day and night just floating in the sea. I don't know those of you who have been in an open body of water on a boat, but to me, even that is scary to imagine being there alone on a plank or something like that, Titanic style. Awful. (laughs) Just awful. That's a nightmare. But in all seriousness, we see that Paul kind of went through it all. It seems like there was no form of trauma he did not experience, both from the hands of men, but also natural disasters. So I think he's a good person to look to for how to handle it. And he also helps us realize that no one is immune to the evil that's in this world. You look at a guy like Paul, one of the most important apostles sent to spread the good news of the gospel to the whole world, shouldn't he get a pass? Why him? Why Moses? Why did Moses have to deal with setting the captives free? Why did the Israelites have to see their brothers and sisters die next to them? Why did the early Christians, Paul included, have to see their brothers and sisters martyred for the faith? There's something about it that in our minds just doesn't add up. And then we think about ourselves. We believe in God, we follow Christ, so why us? Why do we still experience these traumatic events? Why are we still victims? Well, the easy, not so easy, but simple answer is because of sin. Traumatic experiences are the manifestation of evil that plagues this world ever since the fall. Ever since the first sin of Adam and Eve, unfortunately, trauma has been a part of the human experience, a part of the experience even of God's own people, those who believe in him. And the devil uses trauma, just like he uses anxiety and depression. He uses it as a tool. He uses it, he afflicts us in our weak moments because he wants to answer that question of why for us. That question, why me? The devil wants to say, because your God doesn't love you or because there is no God who cares for you. He tells another lie. He says, it's your own fault. It's a lie that is believed by many victims of trauma, that they have brought their own traumatic experience upon themselves because of the way that they've lived, because of who they are. Those are lies. Those are lies that the devil would use to turn your trauma into a prison, into a way of enslaving you. Those are lies because there is hope. There is an escape. And if Paul could believe that, after all he went through, we can believe it too. So what did Paul do to escape the prison of those traumatic experiences that haunted him? Well, we look actually a chapter further, immediately after what what he said in today's reading, when he listed that laundry list of ways he had been suffering, he said this. He said, Three different times 
I begged the Lord to take it away. He talked about his trauma. He called it a thorn in his side meant to plague him and torment him. A messenger of Satan is what he called that suffering. We don't know which trauma he was talking about when he was talking about that thorn. It might have been one or it could have been all of those things together. But he said it tormented him and he begged the Lord three times to take it away. So that's the first thing that we can do. That's the first thing that someone who has undergone trauma or is going through a period of immense suffering is to pray. Psalm 34 says that the Lord hears those who call upon him and rescues those who call on his name. We can pray because we know we have a God who hears us and who rescues us. But what we are always reminded of is that God's rescue plan rarely looks how we expect it to. It rarely occurs in the way or in the timing that we would like. And Paul realized that too, because he says he begged three times, but three times he got this answer. Three times the Lord said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. Now, I think Paul kept praying because he didn't like that answer the first time. He didn't like that answer the second time either. And who could blame him? My grace is all you need, but I want something else in addition to your grace. But after that third time of begging the Lord to take away his pain, he finally realized what he could do next. And it sounds really strange, but what he did next was he boasted in his weaknesses. Basically, he bragged about how weak he was. And there's a connection between trauma that we face and weakness. Because when somebody faces a traumatic experience, it forces that person to realize how weak and out of control they really are. It forces them to realize how little of the environment around them they have control over. Trauma points us to weakness. And that can be a scary, depressing, awful place to be until we realize what Paul realized, that weakness is an opportunity to rely on God's strength. Weakness is not just a time when we focus on how miserable life is and how hopeless it is, but it allows us to put hope in something else, something greater, in God's grace. Unfortunately, sometimes we need a reminder that we are not strong on our own. And while it's not the reminder that we would choose for ourselves or anybody that we love, God can use even the most horrific things that have happened to us. He can use the most vicious tools of the devil. He can use them for our good. And he promises to do that for his people. He can use our weakness to point us to God's strength. And not only that, but there's something else built into it that Paul realized. Our weakness, our pain, can also serve others. Maybe not right away, but Paul says earlier in this letter to the Corinthians, he says in the first chapter, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. 
He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. When we receive and are made aware of God's grace in our darkest moments, it plants a seed in us that can grow and blossom so that we can help love others in their darkest times. That's why Paul lists all of these terrible things that had happened to him. He's not looking for pity from the people he's talking to, but he's trying to show them that he has experienced all of these things and he still relies on God's grace and that God's grace is enough. And he uses that to teach those experiencing similar kinds of suffering. Now, Paul said that God is the source of all comfort, even in moments of trauma. But what, what is that comfort? When we talk about God's grace being enough, what does that even mean? And as I pondered that question, what comfort is there for those enduring trauma, I was reminded of a phrase that is spoken about Christ over and over again in the Gospels. It says that Christ saw the people and had compassion on them. One example is in Matthew chapter 9. It says, Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw everything that the people were going through. He saw people who were sick, who were blind, who couldn't walk. He saw people who had been traumatized by those around them, by their own life experience. So that's one comfort that we can remember. God sees your pain. He sees the trauma that you have experienced. And not only does he see it, but it moves him to compassion. The word for have compassion in the original language is actually a really cool word. I don't think compassion really does it justice. It's more like his heart breaks for you. He sees your pain and he is broken inside when he sees it. God doesn't just see your trauma and ignore it. He doesn't just hear your prayers and say, that's not my problem right now. He sees your pain, your suffering, and it breaks his heart. And he doesn't just see it. Christ knows it. He knows your pain, because he endured his own trauma when he came to be man here on earth. We can't forget that Christ was beaten. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was abandoned in his darkest moment by his closest friends, by his family. So he doesn't just see your pain. He knows your pain. We also know that God is a God who heals. He sees your pain, he has compassion, and he heals. When Christ saw the people in this text, he immediately went about healing everybody miraculously of all of their illnesses, all of their pain. And he went about forgiving their sins, not just healing them physically, but spiritually. And he still does that today, although maybe not in the same miraculous ways where he's touching people to make them well or casting out demons with just his words. But he sends people to help people. For that reason, we can thank God for our mental health professionals who are here 
to help. God puts them in our lives to help us reckon with and reconcile the traumatic experiences that we may face. He sends us brothers and sisters in Christ to point us back to him, to point us to God's grace, to God's compassion. Immediately after this, it says that Jesus sent out his disciples to go and preach the good news and to continue healing throughout the land. And today he sends pastors to keep preaching that good news, to keep pointing to the God who offers a different kind of peace that the world cannot. To point to the ultimate healing. Because while our trauma may never fully leave us here on this earth, we are pointed to a day of ultimate healing. A day when we we reunite with our Father in heaven, in paradise where there is no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more trauma. And we can hope in that promise because Christ saw us and he had compassion and his compassion moved him to the point that he was willing to die to take away our pain. To take away the sin that afflicts this world and makes it hard to live in, to take away the darkest moments that you've experienced. Christ came and he reminds us that his compassion, his pouring out his life for us, has paid our debt. He suffered so that we don't have to suffer anymore. And not only did he suffer and die, but he rose again, conquering death, conquering sin, conquering all of the evil in this world that afflicts afflicts us and afflicts our brothers and sisters and secures for us a salvation and a day where we can have true peace and happiness. God's grace is enough for you. Your trauma is not your fault, no matter what the devil tells you. God has not abandoned you. God sees your pain and your hurt, and he has compassion. His heart breaks for you to the point that he would send his only son to show you his love by dying on the cross. His compassion poured out for you on the cross will make you well. He will heal you. Amen.